How has evolution enabled animals to develop their incredible sense organs over the eras? Our world is full of diverse animals, each boasting unique sensory organs that have been shaped and sculpted over millions of years of inspiring evolution, weaving a story of adaptation. The secrets of the environment, carefully captured by the sensory system, come to life within us, vibrating through the pathways of the nervous system. The sensory system operates through specialized receptor cells that convert external stimuli into changes in membrane potentials. Every sensation, every emotion, every reaction finds its source in this complex and magnificent ballet. It's at the very heart of our being that interpretation takes place, where signals take shape, where reactions fit together, like pieces of a divine puzzle. The central nervous system analyzes, understands, and orchestrates our responses, making every fiber of our being vibrate through the messengers of the peripheral nervous system. Human beings and most animals have evolved five distinct senses. Chemosensation is broken down into two main senses, taste and smell. These two senses are based on the interaction of chemosensory signals with molecular receptors. All visual perceptions belong to a single sense, sight, which uses light reflected or emitted by objects to explore the surrounding environment. Hearing is considered a single sense and is specifically dedicated to the perception of sound, while touch is dedicated to the detection of mechanical stimuli, such as temperature, pain, pressure, and vibration. Each sensory system, whether special or general, requires sensory receptors to detect the stimulus. Different sensory receptor cells are specialized in detecting different types of stimuli and are classified according to the type of stimulus detected. Natural selection has played a key role in determining the functions of sensory systems within each species, resulting in variations in these systems according to the specific evolutionary history of each lineage. In this way, sensory receptors have evolved in parallel with the evolution of external stimuli. Dear Traveler, welcome. Today we're off to discover the world of animal perception to explore the incredible stories of adaptation and evolution that have given rise to today's rich sensory diversity. But before we set off on a new adventure, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a thing. Thank you and have a great trip! In general, we might assume that animals need neural networks to feel, perceive, and behave as these networks perform complex neural computations that promote their survival. Nevertheless, amoebae and other single-celled organisms can move around and sense their environment without the need for a complex nervous system, thanks to a process known as chemotaxis. So it should come as no surprise that unicellular organisms contain simple but effective sensory structures. Indeed, they possess the most primitive sensory mechanism, and arguably the simplest means of processing the information they receive from the environment around them. This is particularly evident in the case of vision, with a functional eye-like ocelloid in dinoflagellates and in the case of cyanobacteria, which seem to have what it takes to qualify as one of the most elementary vision systems, the senses of touch and hearing are also derived from single-celled organisms. However, 
In the case of chemosensation, it has been proposed that smell is more correctly defined by the neural system used, implying that olfaction evolved after the transition to multicellularity. The visual pathway is undeniably one of the wonders of nature. The ability to see near and far, in black and white and in color, while embracing a wide field of vision, certainly represents an evolutionary advantage of remarkable, almost miraculous magnitude. To understand the history of vision, we need to go back in time to explore the theories of eye evolution. Step by step, we understand how this organ has developed over time. Scientists have been divided into two camps. On the one hand, there are those who believe that eyes had a polyphylogenetic origin, meaning that the eye would have evolved independently several times in different species. On the other, those who believed in a monophylogenetic theory, asserting that all eyes derive from a common ancestor, and that each eye type had evolved separately according to the specific needs of the organism. According to recent studies, the trend favors the second theory, i.e., the monophylogenetic origin of eyes. Genetic research has revealed that the PAC6 gene responsible for light detection is common to all sighted species. The presence of all three eye types and mollusks intrinsically suggests a monophylogenetic origin of this visual organ. Exactly how long it took for these developments from a single ancestor species to occur remains unknown. Biologists have identified four key stages in the evolution of the eye. Emergence of efficient photopigments, acquisition of directionality, formation of the photoreceptor membrane fold, and development of optical focusing ability. Six hundred million years ago, the first organisms developed the most primitive visual organ, consisting of a single photoreceptor, composed of two distinct chemical substances, a light-sensitive receptor and a pigment. Its unique function was to detect the presence or absence of light, acting as a kind of electrical switch, with only two possible states, on or off. The use of this structure was relatively simple, as it was not used for the perception of movement or localization like our modern eyes. Instead, its role was dedicated to a process called photoperiodicity, which was equivalent to the modern circadian rhythm. In the presence of light, certain reactions occurred, while in its absence they were inhibited. Let's meet a specimen equipped with this very first visual system. This marine animal is very primitive. The hagfish resembles an eel and has no jaws. The hagfish's eyes are very simple and resemble the pineal organs found in non-mammalian vertebrates, especially that they are positioned on either side of its head. Curiously, despite these eyes, the hagfish appears almost blind and reacts very little to light, even when its eyes are removed. It would seem that hagfish eyes aren't really made for vision. In fact, they seem to play a role similar to that of a circadian organ, i.e. they could help it regulate its biological rhythms, like our internal clock. A remarkable example of the evolution of the vision system can be seen in the developmental changes observed in the eyes of lampreys. These changes support the hypothesis that the lamprey's ancestors succeeded those of the hagfish in the course of evolution. Indeed, the Amocoetes, or lamprey larvae, have eye characteristics similar to those of the hagfish. In the larval stage, its eyes are small, sunken under the skin, 
and have a relatively undifferentiated retina, giving it very limited or non-existent vision. Over time, however, a slow process of neuronal differentiation takes place in a specific order. Ganglion cells, followed by amacrine and horizontal cells, then photoreceptors, and finally bipolar cells are formed. This sequence of differentiation is similar to that observed in jawed vertebrates for the development of their retina. When metamorphosis occurs over hundreds of thousands of years, the lamprey's eye undergoes significant transformations. It enlarges considerably, its retina differentiates completely, the lens develops, the cornea divides into scleral and dermal layers, allowing the eye to move relative to the epidermis. As in jawed fish, extraocular muscles develop, and finally, the eye bursts through the surface to form a visual organ similar to that of vertebrates. The process of eye development in lampreys suggests that these animals have inherited their visual apparatus from a common ancestor they share with hagfish. The existence of a hagfish-like larval eye, which transformed into a vertebrate-like eye in adulthood, supports the idea that lampreys evolve from a common ancestor with hagfish. The next step in the evolution of the eye was the fusion of these photoreceptors to form an eye spot. This advance enabled the organism to detect the intensity of light. In simple terms, if several photoreceptors were activated in an eye spot, this meant that there was strong luminosity and vice versa. This adaptation improved the perception of surrounding brightness. Once again, scientists have discovered clues in embryonic development. Early in the process, a neural structure develops and gives rise to the eye, forming two sacs, or vesicles, on either side. Later, each vesicle coils to form a C-shaped retina, which lines the inside of the eye. It's very likely that evolution followed a similar pattern. At a later stage in embryological development, as the retina folds inwards, the lens forms, leading to a thickening of the outer surface of the embryo, known as the ectoderm. The ectoderm swells into the curved space created by the C-shaped retina, gradually detaching from the rest of the ectoderm to become an independent floating element. It is likely that a similar sequence of changes took place in the course of evolution. The exact date of this change remains unknown, but in 1994, researchers at Lund University in Sweden demonstrated that the optical components of the eye could evolve relatively rapidly, within the space of a million years. If this is the case, it is conceivable that the image-forming eye emerged from the non-visual proto-eye in a short period of time on the geological scale. In parallel with the emergence of the eye spot, organisms also develop locomotion mechanisms such as flagella and cilia. These developments led to the need to localize the light source. To fulfill this role, Several eye patches fuse together to form an eye patch, like a patchwork quilt. These eye patches enabled the organism to roughly locate the light source and orient itself in its direction. By grouping several eye patches together in this way, organisms were able to improve their ability to perceive and move in relation to ambient light. In order to improve localization, the eye patch had to undergo progressive expansion. However, space was an evolutionary constraint. In response to this challenge, nature came up with a solution, the eye cup, also known as the optical cup. The development of the eye cup in vertebrates proceeds as follows. The eyes take shape from evaginations of the developing 
diencephalon. Depressions known as optic grooves form on either side of the rostral neural plate. As the neural plate folds upwards and inwards to form the neural tube, these growing regions project outwards and are called optic vesicles. When the expanding optic vesicle comes into contact with the surface ectoderm in a specific region called the lens placode, this induces changes in both tissues. The optic vesicle then invaginates to form the optic cup, while the ectoderm undergoes differentiation to form the lens hollow, which later transforms into the lens itself. It is sometimes suggested that the invagination of the optic cup results from the growth of the lens, but observations show that this cannot be the case. In fact, a normal ocular cup and retina can develop in the absence of a lens, indicating that these developmental processes are independent and follow distinct pathways. This adaptation enabled the organism to precisely determine the angle of the incident light beam according to the photoreceptor activated. Thus, the optic cup played an important role in improving the ability to localize the light source despite the spatial constraints faced by the organism. By this stage, the primitive eye was fully formed and all the species that possessed this organ entered into fierce competition for available resources. This competition gave rise to a major evolutionary event known as the Cambrian Explosion which occurred around 540 million years ago. Scientists argue that the evolution of the eye accelerated rapidly during this period as precise detection of prey and light gave organisms a survival advantage. So the better the eye, the better the organism's ability to survive. This selective competition for improved visual systems played a key role in the rise in diversity and complexity of animal species during the Cambrian Explosion. After the Cambrian Explosion, the next period saw the evolution of two essential eye structures, the iris, followed by the lens. The first step was to isolate the eye from the outside environment, which was achieved by the development of a transparent, epithelial layer, now known as the cornea. Once the light detection system had been separated, the next evolutionary advantage was the ability to focus. Increased focusing power dramatically improved object localization. The first structure to develop this enhanced focusing power was the iris. Thanks to this adaptation, all incoming light was channeled into a single beam according to the direction of the light rays, greatly improving the accuracy of light source localization. The next major development was the crystalline lens. This lens allowed light rays traveling long distances to focus directly on the retina rather than behind it. This enabled the organism not only to locate the light source precisely, but also to perceive the shape, depth, and other properties of surrounding objects in greater detail. The lens thus opened up new sensory perspectives for organisms with advanced visual systems. With the advent of the lens to capture light and focus images, the eye acquired a greatly enhanced capacity to gather information. This improvement would have generated selective pressures favoring the emergence of more efficient signal processing in the retina, going beyond the simple connections between photoreceptors and output neurons. To meet this requirement, evolution has modified the cell maturation process so that certain developing cells, instead of becoming ciliary photoreceptors, become retinal bipolar cells which intercalate between the photoreceptor layer and the output neuron layer. This is why, 
Retinal bipolar cells bear a strong resemblance to rod and cone cells, although they lack rhodopsin and are not sensitive to light. Instead, they react to the chemical or neurotransmitter released by the photoreceptors, enabling them to play an essential role in processing visual signals before passing them on to the output neurons. Camera-type eyes offer a wide field of vision, usually around 180 degrees. In practice, however, our brains are limited in their ability to process all the visual information available at any one time, due to the limited number of nerve fibers connecting our eyes to our brains. As a result, we can only sample a fraction of the visual data available. It is likely that the first camera-like eyes faced an even more severe limitation, with probably an even smaller number of nerve fibers, this constraint would have exerted considerable selective pressure in favor of the evolution of muscles to move the eyes. The presence of such muscles must have existed around 500 million years ago, as the arrangement of these muscles in lampreys, whose lineage goes back that far, is almost identical to that of jawed vertebrates, including us humans. Despite the ingenious features of vertebrate eye evolution, a number of rather counterproductive traits can be identified. For example, the retina is positioned upside down, which means that light has to pass through the entire thickness of the retina, including nerve fibers and intermediate cell bodies that scatter light and impair image quality before reaching the light-sensitive photoreceptors. In addition, blood vessels cover the inner surface of the retina, casting unwanted shadows on the photoreceptor layer. Another tricky aspect is the presence of a blind spot, where nerve fibers that cross the surface of the retina come together, before tunneling through it to emerge as the optic nerve at the back of the eye. This list of inelegant features could be extended to include other examples, these imperfections are by no means inevitable features of a camera eye, as octopuses and squids have evolved independently of camera eyes which do not have these defects. Examining the vertebrate eye in an evolutionary context highlights these seemingly absurd shortcomings as the consequences of an ancient sequence of evolutionary steps, each of which brought advantages to our vertebrate ancestors long before they developed advanced vision. The eye has evolved in many different ways over time, giving rise to a variety of features in different species. Jellyfish, for example, have eyes, and although they have no brain, these eyes transmit information directly to the muscles for rapid reaction. Nautiluses have an aperture without a crystalline lens, adopting a different focusing mechanism. Flies, on the other hand, have many eyes, giving them a wider field of vision. The diversity of ocular adaptations continues with predators, which have forward-facing eyes for better depth perception, while prey have lateral eyes, offering a wide field of vision for detecting potential dangers. In the case of humans, they have developed the ability to artificially correct their vision using devices such as spectacles, enabling them to compensate for certain visual imperfections. Ultimately, the list of ocular adaptations is truly infinite, with each species evolving uniquely to suit its environment and specific needs. All the auditory organs of today's terrestrial vertebrates, whether reptiles, birds, or mammals, have evolved in completely distinct ways. Silated cells, the sensory cells at the base of the auditory organs of all vertebrates, emerged very early in the evolutionary history of animals. They play a significant role in today's non-vertebrate animals, such as ascidians, 
and can be traced back to the first animals with well-developed tissues, the cnidarians, like sea anemones. The auditory part of the ear evolved from a vestibular organ whose evolutionary origin, in particular, the sensory cells themselves, resembles that of the lateral line, a body surface organ used by fish to detect the movement of fluids in water. The lateral line has sensory hair cells similar to those in the cochlea, whose responses are strongly influenced by vicious damping and are linked by a gel-like structure. The damping problem was solved early on by evolving the active mechanisms of the sensory cells and linking them via a gel-like structure to increase both their sensitivity and frequency selectivity. These two features have survived 500 million years of evolution and are common to vertebrate inner ears. During the Carboniferous period, from minus 359 to minus 299 million years ago, tetrapod ancestors successfully migrated to terrestrial life, paving the way for further adaptations of existing sensory systems including hearing from aquatic to terrestrial life. Thus, over hundreds of millions of years, progressive adjustments were made to these organisms so that they could adapt to higher frequency stimuli, first in an aquatic environment and then in an aerial one. It is assumed that the ancestors of amniote vertebrates had a limited hearing capacity for loud low frequency sounds as they lacked a tympanic middle ear. The first terrestrial vertebrates had an auditory papilla that rested on solid tissue and was covered by an autolith, a small mineral structure present in the inner ear of certain animals, notably fish and reptiles, responsible for detecting movement and balance, and composed of calcium carbonate crystals. In amphibians, the otolith membrane was replaced by a tectorial lining that contained no otoliths. In all subsequent lineages, the basilar membrane appeared, freely suspended. In other lines, the basilar membrane showed some adaptation, with moderate frequency selectivity. Around 100 million years after the separation of the tetrapod lineages during the Triassic period, at least five independent developments of tympanic middle ears were observed. These developments functioned as essential impedance-matching mechanisms for the efficient detection of airborne sounds. The absence of an effective middle ear prevents the detection of high-frequency sounds, this gave rise to parallel evolutions, leading to major differences in the auditory systems of tetrapod vertebrates between different clades, while ultimately fulfilling the same function – detecting, transmitting, transducing, and encoding airborne sounds. Paleontological, morphological, and developmental evidence suggests that lepidosaurs, such as lizards and snakes, as well as archosaurs, which include birds and crocodiles, independently developed a middle ear, composed of a single ossicle. Firstly, in birds and crocodilians, the structure of the auditory organ shows marked similarities, such as the presence and distribution of similar cell types. It is therefore reasonable to assume that this structural configuration was reached or initiated at the latest around the separation of their ancestral lineages some 160 million years ago. Similar reasoning applies to Lepidosaurs. In Tuataris, which separated early from other Lepidosaur lineages, the cellular configuration of the auditory papilla is similar than in lizards. 
In tuataras, as in turtles, there is only one type of silated cell, and all silated cells have the same orientation. Thus, the more complex structure typically seen in lizards seems to have arisen after the tuatara lineage separated from the squamates. However, it is not known whether lepidosaurs, including the tuataras, developed a tympanic middle ear all at once. Finally, in mammals, the characteristic structure of the auditory organ, known as the organ of corti, is essentially found in all recent groups of mammals, although there are marked differences between monotremes and therian mammals. We can therefore assume that the organ of corti appeared before these lineages split between 220 and 150 million years ago. This comparative analysis suggests that the evolution of the tympanic middle ear in each lineage had significant implications for the later development of the auditory organs of the inner ear. The reduction in bone size and the emergence of new configurations to form the tympanic middle ear probably improved not only auditory transmission in general, but especially that of higher frequencies. This new feature undoubtedly exerted additional selection pressures on the auditory organ to enable optimal transduction of information and its transmission to the brain over time, the mammalian cochlea evolved specifically in different subgroups. Over the course of several subsequent geological periods, mammals diverged considerably, and although the basic structure of their cochlea was relatively constant, differences in length and various specializations emerged. Not only did cochlea develop huge differences in length, they also developed specific specializations in groups pursuing different strategies for locating prey using ultrasonic frequencies in the air, such as bats, and high ultrasonic frequencies in the water, such as toothed whales. For example, some bat species have developed cochlear regions where the length of the organ of corti, dedicated to specific narrow frequency ranges, is considerably enlarged. These adaptations have enabled bats to better detect and localize sounds in their environment, improving their hunting and navigational abilities. On the other hand, there is no reason to expect mammalian auditory organs to be necessarily superior or more sophisticated than those of other groups. Each present-day vertebrate group has developed an appropriate auditory solution according to the evolutionary pressures dictated by the environment, predator-prey relationships, and intraspecific communication needs. Acute sensitivity and precision in frequency resolution, characteristics commonly associated with mammalian auditory organs, have evolved independently in all groups of modern terrestrial vertebrates in response to their own specific evolution and adaptation. Indeed, some species of lizard possess auditory nerve fibers tuned to some of the finest frequencies of any vertebrate, including most mammals. Birds of prey, particularly owls such as the barn owl, rely almost exclusively on hearing to locate their prey, so auditory sensitivity exceeds that of most mammalian species. Echo-locating mammals such as bats and dolphins exhibit a wide range of hearing frequencies, a characteristic almost equaled by certain species of frog which use ultrasonic calls to communicate. In humans, although generation times are ten times longer than in fish, the issue is not so much the creation 
of hundreds of new species, but rather the adaptation of a sensory organ to optimize the processing of communication signals vital for survival and hence reproduction. Whether the evolution of the human cochlea paralleled the development of language is a fascinating question that could be explored by future research. All living cells are irritable to certain chemicals, and this predisposition of cells to be perturbed by chemicals is likely to have led to the eventual evolution of specific receptor proteins to detect chemical signals, and ultimately, to specific chemosensory organs and systems, such as the sense of smell. Olfactory capacity, used for chemical communication, is widespread in the majority of living beings belonging to the animal kingdom, enabling the perception and identification of chemical signals. The sensitivity and chemical range of animals' olfactory systems are remarkable, giving them the ability to detect and distinguish between thousands of different odor molecules. In the animal world, olfaction has evolved to enable the detection of signals from the chemical environment, which contains decisive information on the direction to follow food sources, the right time to reproduce, as well as stimuli to consider pleasant or dangerous. An animal's reaction to chemical signals is the result of a combination of mechanisms acquired during its lifetime and innate predispositions resulting from the cumulative impact of individual experience and evolution through the generations on the olfactory nervous system Evolution has shaped the olfactory system in response to two challenges, the need to explore a wide range of chemical information and the specific sensory challenges faced by each animal species. Generally speaking, vertebrates develop an olfactory system that detects odorants and pheromones through their interaction with cell surface receptors specialized on olfactory sensory neurons and organized in dramatic and subtle ways, enabling adaptations in response to major changes in environment and lifestyle, such as the transition from ocean to land and the predominant development of vision. In terrestrial vertebrates and insects, we often think of olfaction as a chemosensory modality dedicated to the detection of low concentrations of airborne volatile chemicals. Yet aquatic fish and crustaceans, while not encountering airborne volatile odorants, possess sensory systems anatomically similar to the olfactory systems of terrestrial animals. For these aquatic animals, odors are sapid molecules in solution. Olfaction is therefore not necessarily the detection of volatile molecules in the air. In this context, it has been suggested that during the transition between aquatic and terrestrial environments, new demands emerge for chemosensory systems linked to odor detection this happened in a remarkable way, as olfactory stimuli evolved from hydrophilic to predominantly hydrophobic and volatile compounds. This transition granted terrestrial vertebrates an evolutionary option to detect volatile water-insoluble odorants. As a result, it is thought that the complex biosynthetic pathways required to produce volatile compounds, as well as the highly complex combinatorial coding that characterizes olfactory perceptions driven by olfactory receptors, emerged suddenly in just a few hundred thousand years. 
Comparative genomic and phylogenetic studies argue that chemosensory receptors were conserved across aquatic and terrestrial taxa, and that mammalian-like olfactory receptor genes evolved in marine environments before the first vertebrates appeared. These changes in olfactory receptors at protein level, altering their interaction with odorant molecules, play a key role in the evolution of olfactory perception. However, researchers have discovered that this adaptive evolution of olfactory perception can also be influenced by co-expressed olfactory receptors undergoing changes in copy number and protein sequence. Selection also acts on individual olfactory receptor families or subfamilies, favoring specialized adaptation or facilitating chemical communication between members of the same species. Finally, genetic variation among the thousands of unique olfactory receptor genes can lead to behavioral modifications in response to specific chemical signals. Thus, the combination of these mechanisms enables vertebrates to adapt in precise and complex ways to their changing chemical environment. An animal's genome evolves in such a way as to be closely linked to the specific tasks resolved by its nervous system, enabling it to detect odors and respond appropriately to promote survival and reproduction. Recent studies have revealed the presence of ancestral versions of synaptic genes involved in fundamental neuronal communication in various organisms without a nervous system, suggesting a progressive evolution of olfaction. In parallel, studies have clarified that the olfactory capacities of multicellular organisms, as well as chemosensory learning abilities, evolve from life forms not equipped with complex neural networks. In particular, prokaryotes have been proposed as model systems for understanding the evolution of olfactory systems in higher organisms. In fact, bacteria respond to volatile chemical gradients, but also use contact-dependent signaling. In addition, a unicellular but multinucleate eukaryotic organism, Viserum polycephalum, has been shown to be capable of chemosensory detection. Studies have shown that olfactory receptor cells are primary bipolar neurons with a similar morphology between species. They have filamentous dendrites to increase the surface area for stimulus capture and an axon that extends to the central nervous system. Dendritic processes are mainly of ciliary origin in most animals. Although the overall morphology is conserved, the fine details of olfactory receptor cell morphology can be adaptive, i.e. they can vary in a habitat-dependent rather than species-dependent manner. For example, the olfactory receptor cells of land-dwelling crustaceans, such as the giant thief crab, have a morphology closer to that of insects than to that of marine crustaceans. Crustaceans share a common ancestor with insects, and as they lack olfactory receptors, it has been proposed that these receptors evolved when prehistoric insects left the sea to live on land. According to this idea, olfactory receptors evolved because these ancestors must have been able to detect odorous molecules floating in the air, rather than dissolved in water. But a recent discovery contradicts this hypothesis. The discovery of a new type of olfactory receptor, ionotropic receptors, IR, has changed the order of things 
and opened up new avenues of inquiry into the evolution of olfactory receptors throughout the history of life. These new olfactory receptors are present in crustaceans, in which no classical olfactory receptor had been found until now. Since crustaceans were the first to appear in the history of life, before insects and before vertebrates, we can assume that these IR were inherited long before the appearance of the first insects. During development, the olfactory system takes shape from the olfactory placodes, specialized regions of the anterior ectoderm that share cellular and molecular characteristics with other placodes involved in the development of various cranial senses. Certain cell types of the olfactory system preceded the appearance of vertebrates, as did certain mechanisms involved in placode formation. It is likely that these two elements were already interconnected in the common ancestor of vertebrates and tunicates. In vertebrate ancestors, this system evolved into a more complex organ system, integrating additional tissues and specific morphogenetic processes to develop distinct olfactory components. Subsequently, the ancestral placode divided to give rise to the paired olfactory organs characteristic of most modern vertebrates. Thus, a major olfactory adaptation occurred along the amphibian and terrestrial branches of the vertebrate tree, resulting in the formation of distinct neuroanatomical structures expressing more recently derived olfactory receptors. Aquatic vertebrates such as fish and amphibians have an olfactory system similar to that of terrestrial vertebrates, but specialized for the detection of chemicals present in water rather than air. Insects, on the other hand, have a well-defined system in their antennae for detecting airborne chemicals, generally referred to as the olfactory system. However, this system is evolving convergently, independently of vertebrates to perform this function. Unlike fish, amphibians have developed a separate, vomeronasal organ which specifically detects attractive sex pheromones specific to amphibians. In addition, they possess an air-filled main olfactory epithelium, which expresses a vast repertoire of novel class II olfactory receptors that have acquired a role in innate reproductive behaviors. These observations suggest that odor interpretation depends not only on the odorant molecules detected, or ligands, but also on the developmental identities and specialized sensory pathways of the cells that detect these odors. Recent evidence shows that individual mammalian olfactory receptor cells can be activated by several different odorants, and that individual odorants activate several receptor cells expressing different receptor proteins. This combinatorial coding is also present in insects and fish, suggesting that it has been conserved in the evolution of olfaction. Consequently, there are striking similarities between species in the organization of the olfactory pathway, from the nature of olfactory receptor proteins to the organization of the olfactory central nervous system. Although there is a striking evolutionary convergence towards a conserved organization of signaling pathways in vertebrate and invertebrate olfactory systems, the receptor gene families involved have evolved independently. These common organizational features span a wide phylogenetic range of animals. Such conservation also implies that there is an optimal solution to the problem of odor detection 
and discrimination. Either this solution evolved relatively early and was then retained in evolution, or more likely, animals convergently developed identical or similar solutions to the odor detection and recognition problem. The sense of taste is a specialized chemosensory system, one of the main mechanisms used by animals to assess the nutritional quality of food, helping them to make decisions about consuming beneficial foods while avoiding harmful substances in their daily lives. Unlike touch, vision, hearing or olfaction, which are called upon in different behavioral situations, the sense of taste has evolved to play a primordial role in food regulation and motivation. Taste systems detect essential nutrients, as well as harmful substances in food, and trigger innate behaviors that lead to the acceptance or rejection of potential food sources. Most vertebrates can perceive five basic taste modalities, bitter, umami, sweet, salty, and acidic. All vertebrates have some ability to avoid harmful chemicals and seek out nutrients. It is thought that each sense of taste has evolved to detect and motivate the consumption of essential nutrients, and also to detect and avoid potential poisons. It is widely accepted that sweet taste evolved in plant-eating animals to detect energy-rich simple sugars, such as glucose, fructose, and sucrose. Bitter taste, on the other hand, probably functions to ensure that an animal avoids poisons. Indeed, most poisons are bitter, and most bitter substances are harmful, although this relationship is not perfect. The salty taste allows the detection of sodium, an absolutely essential mineral. When certain species of animal lack sodium, and this usually occurs in herbivorous animals, a powerful appetite for salty taste is aroused. And for many species, salt is consumed even when there is no apparent need. As for the sour taste, many have suggested that it is involved in detecting fruit ripeness. Finally, the fifth basic taste, umami, probably serves to signal amino acids and proteins. By comparing animals from different branches of the evolutionary tree, researchers have deduced that the sense of taste probably evolved over 500 million years ago. This would have occurred before the divergence of terrestrial vertebrates, bony fish, sharks, and lampreys, when their common ancestor, a primitive fish, developed a new type of cell. These chemosensory taste receptor cells, located in taste buds, are able to detect chemical stimuli and send signals to the brain via the taste nerves to generate taste sensations. Taste buds are the gustatory end organs in vertebrates ranging from lampreys to mammals. These end organs respond to a variety of sapid chemicals and transmit signals to afferent nerve fibers from three cranial ganglia, facial, glossopharyngeal, and vagus. Over time, taste buds have undergone several modifications to adapt to the dietary needs of different animal species, which explains their varied location in these animals. Not only are they found in the mouth and pharynx, but they can also be widely distributed across the surface of their bodies. Evidence suggests that umami receptors were the first to develop. Researchers have reported the discovery of genes similar to those encoding the receptors used by humans to detect the amino acid glutamate in the genome of the elephant shark, a species that split off from other fish 400 million years ago. 
Sharks lack bitter taste receptors, suggesting that these genes evolved more recently. Ancient fish were probably the first vertebrate animals capable of detecting sour taste. It is likely that these fish did not taste food with their mouths, but rather could detect acidity in the ocean using the outside of their bodies. Variations in the carbon dioxide dissolved in water can create different levels of acidity, which can be dangerous for fish. So the ability to sense acidity would have been essential for their survival. Bitter taste is perhaps the taste that most intrigues evolutionary biologists. It's the Darwin's Finch of taste, engineered and customized to suit a species' ecological niche. Humans have 24 or 25 different bitter receptors, depending on the individual, each recognizing unique combinations of chemicals. Toxic bitter compounds come in all shapes and sizes, so it makes sense that the receptors that recognize them are diverse. The evolution of bitter taste, therefore, also involves distinguishing between different chemicals. The diets of humans and their ancestors are mainly based on plants, which are an abundant and accessible source of nutrition. However, Plants have developed physical, reproductive, and chemical defenses to protect themselves from herbivores. Herbivores must therefore contend with various obstacles such as thorns, shells, and symbioses with defending animals. Herbivores have developed various strategies to overcome the toxic defense mechanisms of plants. Among these, a particularly effective and widespread method in vertebrate animals is the detection of bitter flavors. It has long been widely recognized that many plant toxins are perceived as bitter, creating a powerful mechanism for minimizing exposure to these harmful substances. By signaling the presence of toxins in foods before they are fully consumed, bitter taste detection helps avoid their ingestion. This ability plays an essential role in the survival of herbivores, helping them to identify and avoid potentially dangerous plants. The ubiquity of bitter perception in vertebrates and its complex role in humans have raised questions about its evolution. One of the most remarkable revelations of vertebrate comparisons is that bitter taste receptors are a relatively recent evolutionary innovation. While they are present in bony fish, lobe-finned fish, and tetrapods, they are not found in cartilaginous fish. Thus, bitter taste receptors must have first appeared in an aquatic species around 430 million years ago. This makes them the most recent of the chemosensory receptor families in vertebrates. The origins of the receptors involved in taste perception in animals are the subject of much speculation. Similarities between the evolution of vascular plants and the Cambrian explosion in animals suggests that the origin of these receptors may be linked to an important transition in plant-to-herbivore interactions. However, there is also evidence that these receptors play other roles, such as detecting nutrients in the gut, suggesting that their function as taste receptors may have emerged later. The bitter taste receptor family has diversified within and between taxa, with repertoires of bitter taste receptor genes varying in size across species genomes. Studies show that selective pressures on taste perception represent the most obvious potential driver of diversification of these genes. 
fish have different numbers of genes, ranging from one in Amazon Molly to 74 in Koalacanth, but most fish have an intermediate number of genes. Variation in the number of bitter taste receptor genes occurs in different groups of animals, such as fish, amphibians, and saurians, Sicilian amphibians, which include limbless amphibians, have the lowest number of genes, while anurans, which include frogs and toads, have the highest number among all recorded vertebrates, probably reflecting their adaptation to variable lifestyles and environments. In fact, most frogs and toads inhabit both aquatic and terrestrial niches, which necessarily contain a greater variety of toxic substances. Consequently, their ecological needs should encompass very different requirements for their gustatory systems. For example, aquatic factors such as pH have been shown to influence the divergence of taste receptor genes. Most frogs feed on worms, insects, and other small arthropods, which contain more potentially toxic substances. It is known that insects often sequester toxic compounds from plants for their own defense, suggesting that anurans may benefit from the ability to detect dangerous prey. While Sicilians are animals adapted to life underground, living in soil layers rich in organic matter, they build tunnels to get around. All Sicilians are carnivores, feeding on earthworms, plathomaths, arthropods, frog eggs, and tadpoles. Compared with frogs, Sicilians are less sensitive to bitter taste as animal tissues contain fewer toxic substances. Consequently, we hypothesize that the lifestyle, ecological, and dietary complexity of amphibians raise their evolutionary pressure for a wide variety of taste receptor genes. Saurians, which include crocodiles, lizards, snakes, and birds, also show variation in the number of these genes. Snakes have low numbers, while crocodiles, turtles, and lizards have higher numbers, similar to many fish. Repertoires of bitter taste receptor genes in birds and mammals show great diversity. Penguins and cetaceans have few or no functional genes, while birds such as zebra finch and white-throated sparrow have several. Primates, including man's closest relatives, have an average number of genes, with the gibbon having the fewest and the chimpanzee the most. Although toxins are a threat to all herbivorous animals, not all species are equally exposed. This variability is reflected in the size of genetic repertoires, which is related to the proportion of plant-based diets for each species. This trend is particularly marked with herbivores having larger repertoires than carnivores. The most extreme example of this variation is found in obligate carnivores such as whales, penguins, and pinnipeds, which swallow their food without chewing resulting in a total absence of certain genes linked to toxic detection. Around seven to eight million years ago, humans had one last common ancestor with other great apes. If we look at the current eating habits of great apes, we can deduce the diet of our common ancestor. It seems that this species was omnivorous, feeding mainly on tropical fruits, and also included leaves and insects in its diet. Chimpanzees, our closest relatives, rely heavily on fruit for their caloric intake, with a small proportion of their diet 
coming from animals such as other apes and insects. Between 4.4 and 2.3 million years ago, human ancestors left the forest for the savanna and other ecosystems, and their food repertoire expanded considerably. Thus, over time, early hominids gradually abandoned the eating habits of forest monkeys and increased their ability to obtain a variety of nutrients in order to adopt a more diversified outdoor diet. Despite this dietary evolution, our need for fruit and our attraction to sugars and acids, shared with other great apes, remained intact. From a nutritional point of view, fruit is attractive because of its sugar content, which provides intrinsic satisfaction, as well as vitamin C, which is essential for life support in hominoids. The question of why humans are sensitive to acidic flavors and even inclined to prefer acidity has sparked debate in the scientific community. Signals from acidic substances do not provide much nutritional value, with the notable exception of vitamin C. However, this exception is significant because unlike most mammals, monkeys and apes are unable to synthesize vitamin C due to the loss of a functional version of the gene encoding gluconolactone oxidase. The common ancestor of arthropoids that suffered this enzymatic loss probably had to rely on a sufficiently rich source of ascorbic acid from fruits and other plants for the enzyme to become useless. It is plausible that the acidic taste played a necessary role as a guide to identifying vitamin C rich fruit. In addition, the combination of acids with sugars could also have been used to assess the degree of ripeness of the fruit using mixtures of sweet and sour flavors. Thus, acids are not stimuli for which we have evolved to react in isolation, but rather elements we have experienced in the context of the sugars present in fruit. As a result, sweet and sour flavors are perceived as synergistic in the fruit aroma palette. In addition, acid and sour taste act as indicators of fermentation processes which human beings around the world seek out and consume. Wild apes depend mainly on forest plants, especially young leaves for most of their daily protein intake. Nevertheless, early hominids and modern humans have shown a preference for consuming slightly more digestible protein sources, such as meat. Although umami taste is not immediately apparent in fresh meats, it develops significantly in aged or cooked meats. Consequently, it seems that chimpanzees do not possess a gustatory system specifically dedicated to detecting the taste of glutamate or ribonucleotides, even though they can perceive these stimuli. The characteristic umami taste of hydrolyzed protein is mainly carried by glutamate and ribonucleotides. Humans have developed a preference for glutamate ribonucleotides, and umami taste, probably as signals indicating more easily digestible proteins in lightly aged or cooked meats. Indeed, there is ample fossil evidence to suggest that culinary practices predate the advent of modern man. Humans the world over take advantage of a wide variety of plant and animal products that undergo fermentation. Our strong attraction to the taste of free amino acids and ribonucleotides may stem from a tendency to consume fermented foods, including lightly aged and or cooked meats. This category of food would bring various benefits to the survival of our species, Fermentation facilitates access to macro and micronutrients, 
while providing probiotic bacteria. Although it has been assumed that the pleasant taste of glutamate and ribonucleotides acts as an indicator of protein, many protein-rich foods are not particularly tasty or umami when fresh. It's the process of fermenting or aging these foods that releases the umami, savory taste of protein. Thus, our attraction to amino acids, particularly glutamate, as well as salty taste, may have emerged from our desire for fermented foods, taking advantage of the nutritional improvements and benefits of probiotic bacteria for our species. Humans stand out from other mammals thanks to a unique phenomenon, a large-scale polymorphism of the salivary amylase gene. This change in our genetics could be the result of our past history linked to the consumption of starch-rich tubers and could have occurred around 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. The number of copies of the salivary amylase gene present in our genome directly influences the production of amylase in our saliva. This enzyme in high quantities and efficiency has the ability to rapidly transform a cooked starch, such as a thick pudding, from a semi-solid to a liquid state in a matter of moments in our mouths. The resulting sugar concentrations can produce sufficient substances such as maltose, which activate brain regions linked to taste and reward. In short, it seems that the human mouth harbors a taste receptor that responds to glucose polymers without necessarily inducing a conscious taste sensation. This receptor can be stimulated by the products of starch decomposition in the mouth, especially in the presence of high levels of salivary amylase. Human beings have a natural tendency to seek out the taste of salt in food. We find the taste of moderate concentrations of salt very appealing, as do other omnivores. But high levels of salt are considered unpalatable to us, as they disrupt the osmotic balance of our body fluids. Salt is a widely used ingredient in food preparation throughout the world, and individuals from different cultures consume roughly the same amount of salt every day. This similarity in salt consumption across cultures suggests that our salt intake is regulated by intrinsic biological factors. A carnivorous animal absorbs salt at every meal, while a herbivore can easily run out of sodium, triggering a desire for salt, which translates into a search for natural licks. An omnivore's exposure to dietary salt would therefore logically be intermediate between that of carnivores and herbivores. It should be noted, however, that humans lose salt through perspiration, which may explain why we have a slightly higher salt intake preference than other omnivores. Since our earliest prehistoric ancestors, the sense of touch has been central to our survival and reproduction. What we touch can have a direct impact on our ability to survive and reproduce. It may be a predator, prey or parasite, a parent, lover or child, shelter or danger, a tool or food source, the ground beneath our feet, or the branch we use to swing, it's also the first sense to develop, with some fetuses responding to touch in the womb after just eight weeks. Evolution has created a tactile system made up of different sensors and receptors, which together detect the qualities of what touches our body and what our body touches, such as weight, temperature, and texture, so that we can deduce useful information. Many animals, including some cholanterates, 
annelid worms, insects, and many other arthropods, birds, and mammals have hairs or capillary projections that are richly supplied with nerves and serve to indicate to the animal that it is in contact with an object. These hairs may have been specially modified, for example, vibrissae or whiskers in certain areas of the body, such as the face or toes, to provide more sensitive discrimination between stimuli. A second type of tactile receptor, the subcutaneous receptor, is found in the skin. Receptors of this type are found in almost all animals and may consist of free nerve endings or complex carpuscles. Unicellular organisms already possess the capacity for directional detection of tactile stimuli, as can be seen in ciliates such as paramecia which move away from the stimulus source following mechanical disruption of their outer membrane. Sponges, the simplest multicellular animals, do not possess neurons, but they do have the capacity to respond to variations in water flow and pressure in response to the movement of their immobile cilia. However, the evolution of neural conduction has led to a radical change in the ability to respond rapidly and flexibly to tactile stimuli. Cnidarians such as jellyfish and hydra, despite their relatively simple nervous systems, can exhibit coordinated patterns of motor response to sensory stimuli, and many have a rich capacity to respond to touch. For example, hydra nematocytes are structures that provide a good model for understanding the mechanoreceptors of more complex invertebrates. In jellyfish, groups of hair cells called tactile combs regulate complex behaviors, including escape, feeding, and locomotion. The advantages of sensitivity to mechanical stimuli provided by hair-like structures may have encouraged their convergent evolution in several animal lineages. For example, the ciliated cells of jellyfish appear to be sufficiently different from those of vertebrates that a common origin for both is unlikely. Studies into the molecular basis of mechanosensation in different classes of animals also suggest that the cellular mechanisms required for tactile detection may have evolved several times. All animals with a central nervous system respond to touch. The nematode, Sanar habditus elegans, is an important model organism in neuroscience. It is the first animal system in which the entire neural network involved in tactile behavior has been identified. This worm has mechanosensory cells located in the integument beneath the cuticle linked to six sensory neurons, 10 interneurons, and 69 motor neurons. In larger, probably more advanced animals, touch-induced behavior becomes more versatile and complex. The leech has developed a central nervous system with a succession of ganglia for each segment. Each ganglion houses three groups of mechanosensory neurons, all of which respond to mechanical stimulation of the body, but with different response thresholds. Tactile cells are the most reactive and respond to the gentle touch of the body wall. Pressure cells respond to more intense tactile stimuli, while nociceptive cells are sensitive to very powerful and potentially harmful stimuli. In arthropods, mechanoreceptors are located in strategic areas of the body where movement is most likely to occur. In proprioception, these are the joints, muscles, and tendons. In contact, they are the surface areas where contact with external objects is most likely. Arthropods exploit these strategically important locations in two ways. 
On the one hand, they use tufts of hairs called capillary fields, or capillary plates, to detect movement between adjacent body segments through proprioception. On the other hand, to detect contact, they use similar hairs but located in different parts of the body, with a particularly high concentration where contact is most likely and or most important to detect. Spiders and insects also use hair scintilla for proprioception and consequently for active touch detection, where the active movement of a limb must be monitored. Among today's arthropods, only myriapods, crustaceans, and insects have specialized touch sensory structures, the so-called antennae. These sensory organs are equipped with a particularly large number of sensilla, displaying a density far greater than that found on most other body regions. Crustaceans have two pairs of antennae, while insects have only one pair. The generally accepted hypothesis is that over the course of evolution, insects are likely to have lost their second pair of antennae, meaning that the insect antenna shares a common evolutionary origin with that of crustaceans. Fish and amphibians have mechanoreceptive organs called neuromasts, which are arranged in rows on their body, head, and tail. These neuromasts may be present autonomously on their skin or inside fluid-filled channels. The main sensory component of each neuromast is a group of hair cells that respond to hydrodynamic stimuli caused by water movement or variations in water pressure. In this way, the lateral lines provide a sophisticated sensory system for detecting the distant origins of water movement, such as predator or prey behavior, water currents, and the topographical features of the underwater environment. Mammalian skin evolved from the integument of earlier vertebrates in a complex evolutionary process that is still only partially identified. What is clear is that the first mammals, or perhaps their reptilian, the rhapsid ancestors, redeveloped hair as an adaptation of the outer epidermal layers of their integument. While dense hair clearly has a thermoregulatory function, the evolution of hair in mammals cannot be attributed solely to the goal of regulating body temperature. On the contrary, it is very likely that the first hairs were primarily used for tactile functions and their subsequent evolution gradually gave them a secondary role as insulators. The main sensory function of hairs persists in vibrissae, also known as tactile hairs, present in all therian mammals, such as marsupials and placentals, with the exception of human beings. In cases such as the naked mole rat, a species that has lost its entire coat, tactile hairs have been maintained throughout the body because of their importance to the sense of touch. Many mammals have evolved to have areas of hairless skin, also known as glabrous skin. In humans, these areas include the skin of the lips, hands, fingertips, and soles of the feet. These are the parts of the body that play a key role in physical interactions with the outside world, and where tactile precision is particularly important. So it's not surprising that hairless skin is characterized by a high density of mechanosensory receptors that are extremely sensitive to delicate touch, which could contribute to the effective or social tactile capacity that could be specific to mammals. Only mammalian species have elongated facial vibrissae, also known as vibrissae, which extend outwards and forwards from the animal's snout. 
They form a tactile sensory network that envelops the animal's head. Species without fibrasae, or in which they were less apparent, were generally the most evolved representatives of their order. Consequently, having facial vibrasae was an ancestral characteristic of mammals. Many terrestrial mammals, especially those that are nocturnal, live in low-light environments or climb trees, and have evolved highly specialized tactile sensing systems via vibrasse. Research has focused on a variety of these animals, including rodents such as the rat, mouse, and golden hamster, as well as insectivores such as the Etruscan shrew and the Brazilian short-tailed marsupial possum. In some seal species, vibrasse have adapted to detect disturbances left in the water by fish. By measuring these hydrodynamic flow fields, these animals are able to track and capture fast-moving prey in total darkness. Deep-sea foraging pinnipeds, such as the bearded seal and walrus, have evolved a highly specific vibrissal adaptation designed to optimize their efficient search for shellfish and other invertebrates in the muddy layers of the seabed. The abundant, dense, and mobile vibrasse of these animals combine to form a kind of sensitive, tactile rate that enables them to detect and ingest their prey at exceptionally fast speeds. Manatees have vibrasse distributed throughout their bodies to compensate for the limited visual information available in their natural environment. The manatee's ability to move efficiently through rough waters suggests an overall body ability to perceive hydrodynamic signals to the sensitivity of its vibrasse, which has interesting parallels with the lateral line of fish. These adaptations underline the importance of vibrissal touch detection in the ecology of many aquatic mammals. Human fetuses begin to sense their environment through touch as early as the eighth week of gestation, contributing to their body awareness. After birth, the mouth evolves to become the primary means of discovering surrounding objects. But this haptic focus shifts to the hands as we grow older. It's not surprising that humans lost their facial whiskers over the course of evolution, as our hands took over as tools for tactile exploration of the immediate environment, while also enabling us to manipulate with skill and precision Unicellular and multicellular organisms have developed different strategies to ensure their survival and communication with their environment. These strategies include molecular, anatomical, and physiological systems that enable them to detect and respond to chemical signals from other cells or organisms. These communication mechanisms are the result of organisms' ongoing adaptation to environmental factors and biotic interactions. Over time, organisms have developed adapted receptors that enable them to detect and respond to specific signals.